Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. It's really great to see so many people here today. Uh, so we are uh, Monzo Bank, and we're going to talk to you today about um, how we built uh, a bank in the cloud using open source technology, and, and then specifically how we actually make card payments work. So when you go into a store and you make a purchase, how that actually all comes together and combines various technologies to, to do the things that make Monzo work. Uh, but, but before we dig into that, a little bit about uh, Monzo. So we are a fully licensed and regulated bank in the UK. Um, we have these lovely hot coral cards. Um, and you can open an account with us in minutes from your sofa. Um, it's all done through our app. It's a, it's a really, really lovely experience. So we currently have around 3.5 million customers in the UK. Uh, and we are uh, growing at a rate of around quarter of a million customers every single month um, as well. So. Uh, our goal isn't just to, just to be a cloud-based bank, though. That's kind of a, that's just how we, how we operate. What we want to do as a, as a company is to make banking better for our customers. So um, that's by providing very rich insights into your incomings and outgoings um, as a consumer. And, and more than that, we want to become the financial control center for your life. So that doesn't mean selling you all of the, the Monzo products, but it means that when you like, necessarily have products from various places, so mortgages with different providers, um, and you might have student debt, the, you should be able to eventually see all of that kind of information in one place, just to, to kind of re reduce that cognitive load that comes with uh, managing your money. So we do all of the, the normal things you might expect from a bank. So we can do Google Pay, uh, Apple Pay. Um, but being a bank that was built in the 21st century, we also started with APIs in mind. So it's, it's amazing to see what people have done with this. Um, everything from uh, crafting their own UIs um, for the bank um, through to uh, people who've done very, very detailed spending analysis and breakdown um, built on this thing. And, and we ourselves, we um, one of the, the first financial institutions to integrate with If This Then That, the, the kind of automation platform. So you can do some really interesting stuff with that. Um, so we have people who've set up applets that do things like moving money out of savings account and into their spending account when they run 5K with Strava. And then conversely doing things like when you go to McDonald's and you spend, you move money away from your spending to punish yourself. Um, we've, done, we've done loads of other th stuff as well. So at my previous company, um, we used to have uh, ephemeral d developer environments that were running on AWS. And someone at the company built an integration where when you spent money at the coffee shop in the morning, it would automatically trigger the build and, and deploy of your developer environments. So it was ready by the time you get to your, your desk, which was kind of cool. Uh, and as you can see here, so this is our uh, uh, kind of tech-based pun, if you like. Uh, <laughs> it, it's uh, our API for finding our branches. Um, so we, we have no branches. We have no physical presence on the high street. Everything we do lives on, on GitHub. So that's, that's Monzo. Um, we are here from Monzo's platform team. Um, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm the team lead for, for, for Monzo. Um, and Sahel will be talking shortly as well. Uh, he's a senior platform engineer on the team. So when you use your, your card in, in store, a, like a staggering number of things have to happen um, in a very, very short space of time. So um, these are the kind of the key players in, in that, that sequence. Um, I'll talk through them a little bit now, um, and we'll come back at the end to kind of see how they all fit together to make this all work. So the, the first bit we have here is um, the, uh, the, the physical side of things. So the, the bit from the store where you would actually tap your card um, through to um, our physical data center presences, where we have three of those um, very, very small setups there. Um, we then have a, like a, a direct connect setup into AWS. And then we have uh, the, the kind of moving into the cloud. We run everything on Kubernetes. So we have a, a fairly significant microservices architecture. So we're running something in the order of 1,500 microservices at the moment, many replicas of those. So something like 8,000 pods in our, uh, our Kubernetes clusters. We make use of Cassandra for all of our data storage. Um, so everything, everything we have lives in there. We use um, a system called etcd uh, for um, uh, distributed locking and coordination among multiple services. And we use a couple of different queuing technologies for different use cases across the bank. So we've got um, Kafka and NSQ that we make, make a lot of use of. Finally, we, we kind of keep an eye on all of the, the things that are going on across the bank. So um, all of the monitoring that we do. And then we use Prometheus for that too. So we're going to kind of dig into a, a, those, those things and see how they're all set up. Um, and we'll start with the, the kind of data center side of things. So typically, when you think of data centers, your, your mind probably drifts into something like this, beautifully organized racks with cables that are, are wonderfully set up. Now, for, for Monzo, it's a little bit different. So we have um, 
a, a very, very small data sense presence. And, and the reason that we have that is we um, integrate with payment providers like MasterCard um, and Faster Payments, which is like bank-to-bank -bank transfers in the UK. Um, and for those, for those systems, we need to physically have some fiber delivered to us and plugged into a machine somewhere. It doesn't integrate with the cloud. So this is, this is in reality what our racks look like. Um, and these are one of our better racks where we've taken the time to color, co color code our A and B power rails there. And, and the way that the, the kind of the, the flow works from uh, MasterCard through to our infrastructure is something like this. So we will get a message in from MasterCard. It will get processed through our, um, our, our, our physical servers there. It will get encrypted and put into a, a VPN, which runs over Direct Connect. And that will drop the messages out the other side straight into a pod running in our Kubernetes cluster. That pod will be responsible for calling other services that, that run in there to make the decision about whether we can authorize that payment or not. And then the, the flow works uh, similarly on the, the way back. So we'll go all the way back through and we'll return to MasterCard and back eventually to your terminal where you've, uh, you've made that payment. So that's the, the kind of physical side of things. Um, I'm going to hand over to Sahel, who will talk uh, a little bit more about the, uh, the compute that we run in the cloud in AWS. Hi, my name is Sahel. Um, I'm one of the platform engineers on the team. Uh, the rest of the talk will go into how we leverage these technologies to process payments, um, starting with our compute cluster built on top of EC2 and Kubernetes. So Monzo adopted Kubernetes pretty early on. Uh, we started in 2016 uh, when Kubernetes was still like 1.0 uh, and you know there was no uh, COPS or uh, there was no uh, e uh, elastic uh, Kubernetes service EKS uh, provided by Amazon. We had to build a lot of the tooling ourselves uh, and embark on a journey uh, to build our own Kubernetes cluster and learn all of the expertise from scratch. Um, so we run a single Kubernetes cluster uh, in production on top of EC2 uh, with all of our services running. A single cluster can actually get you quite far. Uh, we've been able to deploy over 1,500 microservices with uh, thousands of replicas. I think Chris mentioned 8,000 replicas. Uh, I checked this morning, I think it was, we were closer to 9,000 replicas and going strong. The constantly engineers are shipping new applications. Uh, we are constantly scaling up and down as our demand comes in. This cluster contains all of our microservices as well as our monitoring stack uh, based on top of Prometheus, uh, which gives us uh, metrics uh, for all of our applications. And we also ingest stuff on CloudWatch, uh, which Amazon provides for us, uh, and a bunch of stateful workloads like Kafka. We write all of our microservices in Go. Um, uh, for those unaware or who have not used Go before, uh, Go is a great programming language. Uh, it is statically typed has great network and concurrency primitives, uh, gives you a single binary which you can run on any modern Linux machine. Uh, if you were here for the previous talk, I wholly agree that you should keep your Docker builds uh, small and easy to deploy. That means that when you have them in your container registry, you can pull them down quickly. This helps a lot when you need to scale up really, really rapidly when you've had an inburst of traffic. Uh, Go's binaries are, are all statically typed. There's no dependency management after they are built. Uh, it is really, really good. Um, it's also really simple to get started. Uh, it's a really easy language to write. Uh, you can be productive and write a production-ready application just using the standard library uh, in very little time. Uh, so you may have seen this diagram floating around on Twitter and other so social media. Uh, this is the traffic flow from the Monzo app. Uh, this is actually the real-life traffic flow that I captured on a, on a Sunday afternoon uh, based on users who are actually using the app. Uh, it's a large subset of our 1,500 microservices running in production. It actually takes a lot of things to run a bank. Uh, and you know, our aim is to make banking accessible and provide it be, uh, behind a, a nice and easy to use application. Uh, you know, let us, being the bank, handle the complexity on the back end. A lot of people are quite surprised by this and struggle to understand uh, why we have so many microservices and we, how we can run them without issue. A large part of that is consistency. Uh, almost all of these services are written in, in Go, uh, built, uh, built on top of libraries uh, that we provide as a platform team, uh, using the same sort of frameworks and, and design patterns. Uh, and they are deployed in the same way uh, onto a platform which is optimized for, for running these sorts of services. So let's dive a little bit deeper in how that works. So 
we've wholly deployed, uh, we've wholly optimized our deployment flow. Uh, and in combination, we're working in a single repository, a monorepo, uh, and being relatively opinionated about how services are built, we can ship really, really quickly. All of our services use the same set of common libraries and tooling. If you're an engineer and you switch between microservices or you switch between teams, you'll find the exact same design patterns being used and exact same infrastructure being used. That means you can get up to speed really, really quickly. We use the platform to build the platform uh, and to deploy the platform. It all lives within the same infrastructure. We've spent a lot of time building internal tooling, like, uh, uh, like our system called Shipper, uh, to help engineers ship their changes uh, safely and easily. Uh, engineers at Monzo uh, ship hundreds of times a day. Uh, you know, there are very often times where we redeploy the entire bank online uh, without customers noticing when we want to ship a, a critical change or need to uh, roll out a security update. Um, the, our tooling does all the automated checks uh, to make sure that engineers are shipping code which is safe, reliable, robust. Uh, you know, they're not introducing bugs in their in their applications, uh, not doing things which are like you know not doing uh, things where they're not doing proper error handling and stuff like that. Making sure that they are handling failures, uh, make sure that they have security in mind, they're doing the right authorization and authentication. Uh, all of this is built into the tooling. That means that engineers trodden on a, on a well-defined path. Uh, it's very hard for them to do something out of the norm. So in an environment where you know, Kubernetes pods are, are moving around often, things are never where you left them, how do services find and communicate with each other? So in this particular example, say you are the uh, transaction service and you want to talk to the account service. You don't know where it lives. Uh, you don't know what IP address it's at. It could be constantly changing. How do you figure out where this service lives and send it a, a network request to get some information? Moreover, in, in, a, in, a, in a platform where uh, a single request can fan out to uh, tens of downstream requests, uh, because we believe that services should be communicating rather than sharing data by, by going into storage directly, um, how do we keep that reliable, knowing that the networking can be inherently flaky? The answer for us is to lean on the capabilities of Envoy, uh, which is like a, a, a service proxy or service mesh, depending on who you ask and how you deploy it, uh, combined with our own little bit of infrastructure, which we call the configuration provider. So we have this uh, configuration provider, uh, which is responsible for updating all the Envoy processes. What it does is that it uh, has a hook directly into the Kubernetes API and watches the Kubernetes API for state changes. So when you deploy a new pod or you create a new deployment, uh, the Kubernetes API will inform our configuration provider and that information can then propagate to all of the uh, envoys that are running and are listening for updates. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's what that is showcasing. So in the Envoy world, uh, service to service RPC calls uh, look like this. Essentially, they go through the Envoy. That means a service itself doesn't need to worry about the complexity of finding other, other services and where they are. They can just assume that it exists. Uh, all the networking capabilities are handled by Envoy. This, this layer is responsible for things like service discovery and routing, uh, retries, timeouts, circuit breaking, and observability. Um, the network holds a ton of information uh, uh, within your infrastructure. Uh, with the systems like Envoy, being able to take that, uh, that observability tooling and have that consistently pulled into Prometheus in a common format uh, allows us to do real nice visualizations about how each service is communicating with each other. And uh, you know, the, the request timings and like, how many retries are needed, uh, when things are going wrong, it has, uh, allows us to debug really, really easily. So we've spoken about our platform for running microservices and synchronous communication. Uh, but what about the data layer? Ultimately, services do need to store their data somewhere. Uh, for us, we're using Cassandra, uh, running outside of Kubernetes uh, on top of EC2. Um, so yeah, whilst all of our services are, are stateless, they need to store their data, uh, what we do is as a platform team, we provide a highly available uh, and durable Cassandra cluster. Um, has anyone used Cassandra before? Cool, quite a few hands, but uh, not the majority. So I'll, I'll go a little bit into how Cassandra works. So Cassandra is a highly available and scalable database. Uh, Cassandra nodes join together to form a ring. So essentially your data 
uh, if you take a, a, a database or something, your data is spread across all the nodes which are, are, are present in the ring. There isn't a master. Cassandra is a masterless system, uh, so no one particular node uh, is responsible for coordinating or anything like that. All the nodes are responsible. Um, and typically what happens is in your application, when you talk to Cassandra, you will do uh, round robin uh, load balancing across all the nodes, or you might do something a bit more smarter, like, like uh, weighted load balancing based on response times, uh, latency aware uh, load balancing, or whatever strategy works for you. So in this particular example, uh, the transaction service wants to read some data. It goes into like a round robin fashion and picks the green node uh, to, to get that data from Cassandra. Um, and that green node knows where that particular piece of data lives. So it can go out uh, to those three nodes. Here we're reading in a, in a local quorum fashion. The data is living across three nodes. Uh, it can go out to the three nodes which are responsible for that data. Um, and essentially, when the majority agree uh, or have returned their result, the, the result will be returned to the client. The client doesn't need to know where that data lives. Uh, it doesn't need to make any, any sort of routing decisions. This means that as we add or remove Cassandra nodes and the data shuffles around, all that is transparent from the application. Now, if you want the fastest response uh, and you, know, you want to trade off maybe a little bit of consistency or, or you don't want the most up-to-date view, maybe if you're doing something like uh, analytics processing in the background or something like that, you can use a, a replication factor of one where you just query the data and the node which gives it to you the fastest uh, is the one that, you know, that returns to your application the quickest. It might be that that data is a little bit stale uh, because the, all the updates may have not propagated, but that might be okay for your use case. Now, the query time flexibility uh, allows for a, a lot of really flexible use cases. So having the replication in the quorum mechanism means that when a node dies, which does happen on EC2, surprise, uh, hopefully no surprise to anyone, uh, or you need to restart it, or you need to restart the application, uh, you can just continue business as usual. Um, we very routinely take exercises in just restarting the entire database cluster one node at a time and killing nodes uh, when we can to make sure that that uh, resilience is uh, not. F that resilience is there at the Cassandra layer, and there are no errors propagating into our services. So beyond just satisfying our users uh, and providing an app uh, and you know storing their data in in uh, in Cassandra, uh, there's a lot of work that we have to do behind the scenes to satisfy our banking obligations. So let's dive into how that's done. So we've talked a lot about uh, direct RPCs and the the data flow. Um, but a lot of the compute works happen asynchronously, almost like an event-driven architecture. So for asynchronous message processing, we provide NSQ uh, and Kafka, uh, both of which are really capable, high throughput, and highly available message queues. So last I checked, uh, in our NSQ and Kafka clusters, uh, we have a few billion messages flowing around every day. Uh, for our NSQ nodes, we run them on i3 instances to get the best possible performance with instant storage. What this translates to for customers is that uh, we can deliver this notification that you've spent $4.99 at your favorite coffee shop uh, before your coffee order has even been delivered by the barista. Now, a lot of the flows uh, rely on distributed systems. And distributed systems uh, means you may have problems with uh, ordering and mutual exclusivity. And sometimes you need that mutual exclusivity and ordering amongst these systems. For that, we provide a highly available locking system built on top of etcd. So uh, in, in this sort of distributed system for exclusive operations, etcd is a highly available and distributed and consistent key value store. It has great locking primitives, uh, which allow for high throughput, low latency distributed locking. Running this on top of AWS's uh, uh, i3 infrastructure also allows us to get that guaranteed performance uh, when we're using instant storage with their SSDs. So similar to Cassandra, reads and writes to etcd can come into any node. In etcd, however, the, the slight difference to, to Cassandra is that there is a leader established using uh, a consensus algorithm called Raft. Uh, so in this particular example here, you can see like all the bubbles swarming around. That's a leader election happening in green, uh, and eventually it converges on S5 becoming the leader. Uh, what this means is that all reads and writes 
will go through the leader uh, to ensure the most consistent view. And the leader will make sure that it propagates to a majority, and the majority has written that log to durable storage, in which case is the disk, uh, before, before it uh, gives an acknowledgement back to the client that the lock has been, has been held. Uh, what this translates to is that if the, the leader fails or like, you know, it has maybe a network connectivity issue or there is a partition, uh, another leader election is held uh, and etcd does some really clever stuff with the algorithm to make sure that uh, the, uh, it prefers a leader which has all the rep uh, messages replicated to it already. Um, and like, it, it, it makes sure that like, the, the failover happens gracefully essentially, uh, and you know, the, the it's not the leader anymore. Um, having a distributed consensus is pretty much a required property for locking. Uh, I'm now gonna hand it over back to Chris, uh, who's gonna talk a bit about monitoring. So I guess as you've seen, there's, there's a lot of things going on at the, uh, the platform level at Monzo. So it's um, kind of crucially important that we have like, really good visibility of all those things. Um, and for that, we use um, a combination of Prometheus um, and an open source project called Thanos. Um, which came out of Improbable. So we use Prometheus for absolutely everything. Um, so that uh, covers things from like request metrics through to low level system metrics, um, business logic type metrics. We monitor things like our customer operations, how long their queues are when people are trying to get in touch. Um, we pull in things from CloudWatch. Um, and we also use things like social media. So we have an exporter which will um, look at Twitter and, and look at how many people are reaching out to us. And if there are trends where that spikes, we can, we can alert on that and use that to correlate against things we're seeing in, internally as well. It's quite a useful one. So the monitoring setup we have is, it looks a little bit like this. Um, so we have um, Prometheus uh, sharded out into um, kind of separate functional domains. So you can see here we have one that's looking at our, our microservices, um, one that's looking at our infrastructure, so that might be our EC2 nodes that are underpinning Kubernetes. Um, and then finally, we have one there that, that is looking at Cassandra. Um, and what we do is we, we run two replicas of, of each of those ones so that we can, um, first of all, tolerate failure if it happens, when it happens. Um, so if we lose a node, what we, if one of these servers is running on, it isn't a problem. And, and likewise, we can do routine maintenance on these servers, so upgrades and things like that without losing any kind of visibility. Now, the kind of the, the simple Prometheus story um, for, for running this kind of uh, sharded approach is that you, you either just have multiple sources to go and get your data from, um, and that was something that we really weren't very happy doing. So we didn't want to be in a situation where um, people needed to know which, which uh, Prometheus server to go to to get the, the data for the query that they're looking for. So the other approach you take, uh, you could take with Prometheus is to run a kind of a hierarchical setup. So you'd have a, a Prometheus above these three that you'd see here that scrapes in some sort of subset of those, that data and you can then look at it at that point. And again, we didn't really want to, the concession of not having all of the data that we, we wanted to be able to query all in one place. So that's why we turn to, to Thanos here. So Thanos um, is a bunch of different components that all combine to give you a, a single unified view of all of your, uh, your monitoring. Um, and the way that it works is we basically, so we're running this on top of Kubernetes inside pods, and we have a, a sidecar container inside each of those servers. And what that's responsible for doing is periodically um, taking time series blocks and uploading them into S3. Um, we then have this other component called Thanos Query, um, and what that does is it, it coordinates with uh, the Thanos sidecars, and it essentially presents as if it is a Prometheus server. So when we have a query we want to issue for whatever metrics it might be that we're after, we would go to Thanos Query. Thanos Query then fans that out to all of the sidecars and uh, figures out where the data is and returns it back to, uh, back to the user. What we don't have with, with this setup right now is we don't have any means to look at anything historical. Um, and our Prometheus servers, we, we treat them quite, quite ephemeral, so we run with something like 24 hours retention. And that's where this, this final component, Thanos Store, comes in, into play. So Thanos Store presents as if it is like a, pre a Prometheus server, um, only rather than having the data locally, it's affronting all of that data that we've uploaded into S3. So the combination of all of these things means that we have a, a seamless view across all of the, the shards that we run and also a, a near infinite retention of our, of our metrics data. So we can query and look at trends over a year, for example, or compare today versus last week. Now, th to give you a sense of scale of, of where we're at with our monitoring setup, we have something like eight or 9,000 total scrape targets, um, something in the region of 42 million active time series across the, across the platform, um, and we're ingesting somewhere near two million samples every second um, for this. So people often, often, often like, 
comment on that, and they're like, how, how can you possibly make sense of all that data? There's uh, clearly a lot going on there. And the, and the answer is, oh, bear with. Um, the, the answer is that we, we don't look at all of it all the time, um, clearly. Um, but it's incredibly useful to have all that data as a diagnostic tool for when things do go wrong. Um, and as you see here, this is a, a dashboard that we've got in Grafana. Um, it's called our services dashboard. And what, what this is, is every single one of those microservices that we spoke about, they, because they are built from the same framework from the bottom up, they expose the same core set of metrics. So we know um, about all of the various RPC that they're doing to other services in the, in the platform. We know how often they're querying uh, Cassandra, for example, because they're all built using the same Cassandra library. Um, and we can see how much they're doing, how much lock throughput they're doing. So with this dashboard alone, we're able to query a, a vast quantity of those metrics all in one place. And it's, it's a kind of free resource for anyone shipping a new service. So we've spoken uh, a little bit about, wow, it was just that slide. Um, we've spoken a little bit about uh, all of the things that we have um, running in the platform. Um, and we'll revisit now like how, how they all come together to actually process a payment. So it's... Uh, it starts, as I said earlier, with you in, in a store with your Monza card. You tap it at a terminal. That message will come from eventually through the MasterCard network into one of our DCs. We then process that over the uh, AWS Direct Connect, and that will drop into a, uh, a pod running in a, a VPN endpoint inside of our Kubernetes cluster. That will fan out into uh, multiple services, um, more than you see here. Um, and some of those will take uh, locks against etcd to make sure that they're exclusively processing for either that person's account or, or whatever else it might be. Some of them will be writing things to Cassandra, and Cassandra will be responsible for making sure all of that data is replicated out um, so it's durably stored. And assuming you have uh, the funds in your account and we can approve it, we will, we will send a response back through the whole chain to, to the terminal, and you'll be able to make your purchase for your coffee or whatever else it is. Immediately after that, we will publish a message to say that that transaction has happened. And then we will have uh, some other service which is consuming from uh, whichever queue that, that message gets put on and is responsible for then sending out a push notification which might include what you've spent, uh, how much it was, what your balance is, is now. Now it sounds, it sort of sounds and looks quite simple, but when you look at the, the kind of the full trace for a uh, auth request that comes in through, um, through MasterCard, it really looks something like this. So you can see it's, it's an incredibly, incredibly complex process where there are an enormous number of services involved. So uh, what next for Monzo? Um, we, are, uh, we announced a few months ago, in fact, that we are going to be moving into the States as well. Um, we actually have cards with us today. So if you're a US citizen and you would like a, a Monzo account, please do come and see us. You can sign up and, and take one away with you today. And, and as part of that, uh, we are kind of looking at how we're going to be evolving our infrastructure in future. So currently, we're in one region. We're in uh, EU West 1 in Ireland. And uh, it's going to be increasingly important as we go to multiple geographies and we expand our customer base to, to kind of divide that, that platform up. So we are investigating actively at the moment how we do multi-region. And then within regions, how do we divide things down into, into more like cellular-based architecture? Um, and we'll be leaning heavily on AWS for, for advice there as well. And that is all we have. So thank you very much for, for being here and listening. Are there any questions? How do you guys, how do you guys take care of, uh, like, you know, business logic, like, you know, KYC? Fraud, you know those kind of aspects. Sorry, what was the question? So, how do you guys take care of like you know business logic for like fraud, KYC, you know, uh, all the banking regulations and rules? Uh, that is a really good question. Uh, we have entire teams that are dedicated to ensuring that uh, you know financial crime and stuff is dealt with. Uh, we integrate with a uh, lot of third-party providers, uh, but ultimately all that information is uh, sp fed into our own rules-based engine uh, to, to make sure that we can make the best financial decision uh, for customers and help prevent fraud. Um, 
to be honest, that's not something that we are directly involved in. Uh, we provide the tooling that allows engineers to ship that kind of stuff on our platform. Um, so I don't think we would be the best people to, to really speak about that. Thank you guys for the talk. Uh, since you have such a complex call graph, how do you think about service-to-service -service SLAs? That is a really good question. So the question was about service-to-service uh, -service SLAs. Um, right now, we don't have any strictly defined SLAs uh, between services. Um, what we've done is we've taken the step to having excellent monitoring. Uh, I think the next step would be to define uh, SLAs based on what we see with our infrastructure. Um, Naturally, uh, when we run uh, these services in production, uh, we run them in a highly available fashion with multiple replicas. Every single service is deployed across multiple AZs. So we make sure that the spread happens at the platform layer. Um, but uh, service to service SLAs would really be defined by the, the service teams, uh, you know, based on uh, interactions uh, that they have. So for example, if a service uh, calls out to a third party provider, uh, naturally that SLA needs to be uh, taken into account uh, for their particular service. So we think that by providing all the analysis with the systems that are running in production, uh, they can make the best possible decision about uh, whether they're meeting their SLAs uh, and uh, you know, uh, having automated alerting uh, to make sure that when they are in breach of the SLA, someone is being paged. Um, one thing that we didn't really capture in the monitoring section is uh, we spend a lot of time also writing alerts, automated alerts, to monitor the infrastructure. Uh, this uh, involves uh, using external systems to probe our infrastructure, but also our, using our monitoring stack uh, to alert when things go wrong and link to the right runbooks. So for that, we use a system called Alert Manager, which, which hooks into uh, Prometheus and Thanos. Uh, and you can essentially write Prometheus-style queries to say, OK, if this uh, has breached a threshold, or if there's like a linear regression here, uh, you know, essentially send an alert. Uh, you know, if it's 10% more, than, like more errors than what we'd see on a, on a typical day, uh, then send an alert. And you know, we can then categorize that and say, OK, which team should that be going to? We have very smart routing uh, to make sure that the right, uh, right teams, service teams, get that alert uh, and act on it. Uh, and yeah, essentially first line and second line defense. Just for the talk, guys. Um, quick question about scaling up your teams. Uh, you mentioned here you started only a few years ago. Uh, your team's grown massively over that time. How do you ensure consistency across those teams and that they're all doing, uh, pushing things in the same way, developing things in this consistently? What are some top tips for doing that? Yeah, so I think Sahel alluded to it earlier. We, are, we have kind of accidentally become quite dogmatic about um, the tools that people use. Um, and I think that's been a key differentiator for us, like having a, a massively consistent tool set and way of doing things means that um, like the movement of people between teams is, is fantastically easy and we're able to swarm on problems very, very quickly. Um, I think, I think that's, that's the main one. Um, there's all sorts of things different, different teams across the company are doing to kind of solve problems in, in interesting ways as well. So the platform team, for example, we've grown from sort of four people when I joined uh, a little while ago, and we're now something like 12, 13 people. Um, and the structure of our team is, is kind of changed. So we, we have this concept of ephemeral squads where we basically have um, problems or, or things that we need to fix, and we will s assemble short-lived squads to fix those things. Um, and it's a good way to kind of work inside of a big team um, that's able to share context, but then like limit that right down for, for like daily kind of day-to-day -day things. Cool. Thank you. Um, UK Monza customer, good job, guys. <laughs> Uh, two questions, actually. Uh, do you use any other type of storage than uh, Cassandra and S3 that uh, you showed on the presentation? And um, what is the protocol for that you use between your microservices? Is it HTTP or something else? Uh, for the first question about the uh, the storage layer, um, so yeah, currently uh, all our microservices talk to Cassandra. Um, Ultimately, our, uh, sorry, our services go through a common library. So if we do want to switch that out into the future, uh, it doesn't sound as difficult as it might seem. 
some services do rely on Cassandra more heavily than, than others, uh, so switching those services may be a bit more difficult. But yeah, the honest answer is, is that most microservices are using uh, Cassandra. Uh, so that's why we are very excited about the managed Cassandra offering that uh, AWS announced uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, that was uh, really, really exciting because uh, that's something that we really, really want to look into. Um, your second question was about uh, RPC communication and how that's handled. Currently, we use HTTP, but because all of that is abstracted at the Envoy layer, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what we can do is we can make tweaks, uh, you know, by switching to HTTP2 and, and uh, like, you know, by, by using gRPC at that layer. Um, naturally, what we want to do is we want to move to gRPC at the service layer. So all of our services are currently defined using uh, protocol buffers. Uh, it's just the transit layer in between is JSON because uh, it makes it easy to inspect, easy to read. Uh, but naturally, that comes with some performance downsides. Uh, so we hopefully will be switching into gRPC later on. Hi. Um, having lived in the UK as an American 10 years ago, banking in the UK is so much better than in the US. So my question is, is that now that you're moving into the US, what are some of the challenges that you believe you're going to face going into the US market that's different than in the UK? So the honest answer is we're probably not the best place to answer that question. Um, so we have a, a team that are currently um, based in the US that have moved out there that are, are tr trying to solve those problems. So I think we acknowledge that just because we have a, a working product in the UK does not mean that it's going to work um, for a different a different culture, a different um, a different continent. Basically, um, there are some there are some small things that are, are quite different, like um, the payment flow for when you go out for dinner in the US, where you um, you pay and then they come back and then you have to add a tip. Like those are kind of areas where I think Monzo could help. Like and we're we're kind of. At the, pr at the process, the process at the moment is understanding really the market, making sure we're solving the problems that people have out here. Um, so uh, I would expect there'll be a lot of blog posts coming out about the things that will be changing for the product in the US um, over the coming months as we kind of learn more. Hi, I'm wondering how you um, negotiate proposals for changes to the platform, either the architecture itself or libraries from the engineers working mainly focused on business logic and this platform team. Do you have a board or committee or proposals or how does this kind of work? Or is it all top down? So the question was around uh, like, you know, how do we organize proposals and uh, like architecture review and stuff like that. Um, so uh, one thing that's really ingrained at Monzo uh, is our proposals culture. So any engineer can write a proposal. We have a public Slack channel. We write proposals for everything. It's not only engineering related. Uh, so for example, you know, if you want to change maybe some of the offerings in the office, uh, like you know, maybe the soft drinks that are being offered, uh, then there will be a proposal written for that uh, up for debate. Uh, so that means that all members of the, of the engineering community uh, and wider Monzo as well, so people who are not uh, directly involved in engineering can uh, look at these proposals, learn from these proposals. They're easily searchable in, in our, uh, we use Notion, uh, and you know, they can essentially feed back directly into the proposal. Um, we also have a really strong like one-on-one -on -one culture. So for example, if you want to learn more about a particular system, uh, you, can, you can easily book a one-on-one -on -one with that engineer uh, who will be happy to whiteboard uh, that system uh, or, or like, you know, provide more information in the proposal itself. Um, we also have uh, systems like uh, uh, the Architecture Forum, uh, which is like you know, a, a gathering of people, and anyone can bring any sort of proposal in the Architecture Forum uh, if they're unsure about how they can uh, they want to implement a particular problem, uh, or like you know they want more more broader review uh, across uh, lots of different expertise and domains. Uh, so you know we have people who have read the Mastercard manual back to front and sideways, uh, you know who can recite every single declaration. Uh, we are not those people, uh, but if we had a particular question about that sort of like payment network, you know, if we had a platform perspective to bring to that, we would go to that sort of forum uh, and you know bring our perspective, and they would provide their input as well on like what we need to do to make sure that we comply, uh, make sure we have the best performance, and ultimately the best user experience for everyone at Monzo. Are you planning to launch more uh, banking services such as saving accounts or transfers? Uh, to some other banks, and how confident do you feel about uh, launching those new products at, uh, uh, very fastly in, in your platform? Thank you. Um, so uh, there's no there's no grand plans for us to become um, like the kind of big banks banks that have come before us, where they get you in with a, a current or checking account and then cross sell you to all their other products. Like that's not Monzo's play. Monzo's play is to um, allow you to have your, your money wherever it makes sense for you. Um, 
uh, and we want to be the, the, the best current or checking account that, you, that can possibly be and then allow you to integrate with various other different parties so that you, uh, we, will, we will hopefully streamline that process. So if you need a savings account, you could go to your Monzo app and you could open it and we will show you options across all of the various banks and you can then choose the, the one that's right for you. And as a customer, you end up winning in that, that sense. Like you're gonna have greater choice and greater flexibility to go where it makes sense. I don't know if there's um, PCI compliance in EU, but obviously there is in the United States. So oh, I'm wondering what you had to modify with your, if you've looked at it and what you've researched and what you've modified in your platform or not um, for PCI and things like that. Uh, that is a really good question. Uh, it was around uh, PCI compliance. Uh, we definitely have PCI compliance in the UK, uh, and it's something that we do and have adhered to. Uh, so yeah, we are fully PCI compliant. Um, a lot of things have been around, uh, like the unique way of our infrastructure, like uh, you know, uh, moving to the cloud, running on Kubernetes, means we need to take a cloud and Kubernetes focused approach to PCI compliance. So you know, when the, when the uh, the PCI compliant uh, the PCI assessor comes along and says you need to have a firewall, what they're expecting is some sort of like F5 appliance, uh, like you know, a Barracuda firewall, something like that. Um, uh, and what we do is we say, okay, we, what we have is we have systems like network policies, which at the IP tables layer essentially blocks packets uh, from routing to services. So at the networking layer, we can say with confidence that uh, a packet is not going to make it into a service uh, which is not intended for it to talk to. Um, we've got an entire blog post about it online uh, in our blog. Um, about how we've rolled out PC, uh, sorry, how we've rolled out network policies across our entire infrastructure. So all of our microservices adhere to this sort of network policy to essentially do firewalling at the networking layer. So no service can talk to any other service which it's not intended to. And we manage that via code review to make sure that you know if you're calling a, a sensitive system like the ledger, for example, uh, you know there's only a very small subset of services, and that goes through an engineering approval process. So that it, you know if you develop a new service to have that agility you can go and essentially seek out a, a peer review uh, with the team that maintains that particular service and say, yes, I am authorized. Uh, and then the moment you use Shipper, uh, which is our, our deployment tool, uh, that network policy gets authorized right in the flow of your deployment. The engineer doesn't even have to worry about it apart from going through the code review. Okay, so to the extent that I understand, this is to do with the authorization aspect of your uh, transaction processing of the bank. How do you deal with uh, network settlement or invoice and customers, do you have to do that or does MasterCard take care of all that for you? How does that fit into the overall design? That is a really good question about uh, like invoice settlement and you know authorization and stuff like that. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we are the best people to really talk about that uh, because we are far removed from the payment systems apart from providing the infrastructure and essentially running the data centers. Uh, if you write into our payments teams, uh, I'm sure they will be more than happy to explain. We do have a community forum, and we've also written a lot of blog posts on our engineering blog uh, about how we do these things, because we do want a transparent culture. None of this needs to be hidden behind, behind walls. So yeah, just uh, ask on our community forum, and I'm sure a payments engineer can explain to the extent that they can. Uh, you, you said that you were interested in the managed uh, Cassandra service, but it, it doesn't look like you're using a lot of other managed services. Is that a conscious decision? You're right, no, we, we uh, have built the bank out of raw components and we are like probably the most boring uh, AWS customer. We use EC2 and we use storage and we use networking. And um, we, are, we are possibly gonna change that. We are definitely evaluating um, the more managed offerings. So there, there are things like there's managed Kafka, there's managed Cassandra, there's obviously EKS. Um, for us, it's it's kind of about figuring out where that line is on, on what's differentiating for us. So in the past, we um, have forked Kubernetes code and been able to run our own version of that to fix problems quickly. Um, we would obviously give some of that up if we found issues in, in EKS. Um, but like the flip side of that is that it's really costly to run all of these things like completely yourself. So um, one of the things we're looking at next year is like where we draw that line, which the systems we really care about running ourselves, and which the ones we we would we would love to hand off. Um, I think the, the Cassandra one is really really interesting. Like managing data is super difficult um, and and really scary, frankly. Like no one wants to do it if they can avoid it. Um, so we'll be looking like closely at that one. Do you ever see a situation where like your data centers, your physical data centers will be completely eliminated? Sorry, uh, did you mean completely automated? Oh, eliminated. eliminated. Uh, when MasterCard allow us uh, to, to plug in directly to an AWS uh, feed, uh, 
uh, then yes. Like, you know, running our own data centers, uh, even though we have like one rack uh, across multiple locations, uh, one or two racks across multiple locations, is still really, really painful, uh, difficult. It means that we have to reinvent a lot of the stuff that AWS provides and that we take for granted. Running data centers is really, really hard and not a pleasant thing to do. Um, you know, right now we see it as a necessary evil um, and we would love to have uh, AWS uh, managed systems like that. Um, it, it really depends on like, you know, whether AWS keeps pace with like our rate of innovation. So, you know, there's lots of different payment schemes uh, and, you know, uh, we want to make sure that if we do give up that control that the AWS can hook into all of those payment schemes uh, around the world, uh, uh, for our, which is our ambition. Um, so, yeah, there's going to be a lot of considerations. Uh, but fingers crossed, you know, hopefully we can eliminate those in, in some time. Does that answer the question or was it, do we ever have data centers go, off, go offline? Do we take them offline? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's literally, we have to plug a cable in somewhere. Yeah, sadly. So since you guys have grown so big now, is there any pressure from the regulators to go multi-cloud or multi-region? It's a really good question. Um, no, no, there's no like direct pressure. Um, I, I don't think the, the regulator is concerned at that level of abstraction. Um, essentially, they want us to prove that we are resilient and um, that we're engineering things in a way that is, is like good, good outcomes for our customers. So there hasn't been any pressure for us to go multi-cloud. Multi we, we internally want to go multi-region when it makes sense for us. Um, I, I don't think we want to go too early. Like if you go too early, it can be really difficult and it can slow things down, which is like a net negative for your customers. So um, yeah, like in short, no is the answer. Cool, thank you very much, everyone.